Chapter Thirty One of Bizarre by Lawton McCall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nick Bulka. The Creeping Fingers. Mrs. Waffen's figure resembled that of the punch bowl behind which she was standing. It was broad and squat, with a slight tapering at the base. And her mind was like the punch, Swedish and characterless, with scrappy rinds of things floating about in it. Each guest who presented a cup received the same dipperful and the same set of remarks. Good evening. I'm so glad you could come. I just love hearing ghost stories, don't you? See that log over there? She pointed to a huge gray hulk that lay at the side of the open fireplace. That's real driftwood, and it ought to give just the right kind of light. I found it myself on the beach, and had the gardener bring it home in a wheelbarrow. Look, it's all honeycombed with age. A tall, serious-looking young man stepped forward and extended his glass. He knew that that was the way to please her, and she was the woman who he hoped and feared would be his mother-in-law. She beamed. Do have another, Mr. Carson? He did, for he was in a desperate mood. He was to leave for the city on the early morning train and this evening would be his last chance to propose to Polly for several months. Somehow, despite his best efforts, the psychological moment had never arrived. Just then Polly sailed into the room, fresh and rosy, in a flutter of white muslin. He put down the glass and hurried over to her. "'Good evening, Polly,' he said in an ardent undertone. Couldn't you slip away from this crowd and take a stroll on the beach? No, George, I'm hostess tonight. She shook her head, including some airy little curls, which seemed to make light of her refusal. We are all to gather around the hearth and listen to the stories. Then she added teasingly, Besides, it is in your honor that Mother is giving this party. Yes. She's very kind, I'm sure, he said awkwardly. Think of all the trouble she has taken over that log. Carson faced her with squared jaw. Listen to me, Polly. There's something serious I want to talk to you about. Before I leave you, I... Polly! called Mrs. Waffen. Isn't it time to begin? Perhaps it is, she answered innocently. What do you think, George? I think the storytelling might as well begin at once, he said stiffly. A few minutes later all lights were turned out. The score of young people had settled themselves about the room in comfortable attitudes, some on chairs and sofas, some on cushions on the floor, while in the midst of them sat the narrator, a girl of eighteen, who affected a deep morbidity. Gazing into the fire, she began her tale as though she were in a trance. Carson sulkily picked his way after Polly toward a seat beside the hearth. Just as he was reaching it, he tripped over something bulky. "'Why, that's my log!' exclaimed Mrs. Waffen from the back of the room. "'Dear, dear, why hasn't anyone put it on the fire?' The story waited while Mrs. Waffen scurried forward and personally supervised the placing of the log upon the andirons, and then sat down beside the hearth opposite Polly. "'Do go on!' cried several voices. "'You stopped in the most exciting part!' The narrator, looking daggers at Mrs. Waffen, paused long enough to show that she didn't have to go on unless she wanted to, and then resumed her tale. Suddenly, as he lay there in the haunted room, on the very bed where the old man had been murdered, he felt an invisible hand on the bedclothes. Mrs. Waffen shuddered, and a large black ant peered out of a hole in the log to see what was going on. Then he felt a second hand, more terrifying than the first. 
Beholding his home in flames, the ant rushed back indoors to spread the alarm. Along the highways of the interior he sped, a second Paul Revere, rousing the sleeping insects, of which there were many. Oh, groaned Mrs. Waffin. The exodus of Paul's friends proceeded in orderly fashion. Larvae and eggs first, was the order. Carrying their infants upon their backs, they filed out of the subway openings in steady processions. The hands clutched the covers just above his feet. Fear paralyzed him so that he could neither move nor cry out. A party of refugees applied to Mrs. Waffin for shelter. She was so absorbed in the story that she did not see them. Then the fingers began to creep up, up, up. His flesh tingled with horror. Mrs. Waffin quivered like an aspen leaf. She breathed hard, her eyes nearly popping. Other people began to feel creepy. They clutched his knee and... Mrs. Waffin uttered a piercing shriek and clasped her knee with both hands. She was invaded. Then Polly screamed, and Carson began to slap himself on various parts of the anatomy. There was a general panic. Girls squealed, and clambering frantically upon chairs, shook out their lifted skirts. Young men stamped about wildly, mashing ants and people's toes in equal numbers. Mrs. Waffin, tormented from head to foot, galloping in circles, moaning, Oh, mercy! Oh, mercy! Save me, George! cried Polly, clinging to his arm. Yes, darling, he answered fervently. If the ants had been raging bulls, he would have saved her from them. But they were ants, and their ways were devious. He hesitated, slapping himself thoughtfully. Turn on the lights! yelled someone. No, don't! screamed half a dozen shrill voices. Save me, repeated Polly distractedly. I can't stand this any longer. I'll perish. Struck with a swift inspiration, he caught her up in his arms and started for the door. She made no resistance. Out of the room he carried her, then through the front hall and down the front steps. Halfway down the walk, she asked, where are you taking me? To the ocean. Why, you clever boy! People sitting on the verandas of neighboring cottages saw in the moonlight a sight that electrified them with horror. A powerful-looking maniac, with a helpless woman in his arms, strode across the beach and began to wade out into the water. Hoping to save her, they ran to the shore and put out in boats and canoes. Oh, sighed the victim blissfully, as Carson led her down into the water. It feels so cool and quiet. Polly. George. Row harder, doctor, cried the steerman of the nearest boat. He's trying to strangle her. End of chapter 31